On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in partnership with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Hotez. He's the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine. He's also at the Baylor College of Medicine where he's a professor in the departments of pediatrics, molecular virology, and microbiology. Uh, He's a pediatrician by trade, but you're wearing our classic neurology bow tie, so we really appreciate that, uh, being, being just like one of us. And um, as importantly, and, and oh, where's my patch, uh, a, a, a Cornell Med School grad, got a, your PhD from Rockefeller, which is literally one block that way. Right, right. Um, thanks so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Great. Good to be with you, and uh, good to be with uh, somebody from Cornell Medical School. Absolutely, sharing some good stories earlier. Um, so um, we have 36,000 members of the American Academy of Neurology, and you know, you've know you been on every TV station from CNN to Fox to, I, I've seen you on television, um, but I'm really excited you're here, not just because you're a Cornell grad, but um, I've been doing these videos for the Academy, and actually part of the reason I've gotten interested in this is because of you. Um, I listened to you on a podcast with Peter Atia. Uh, Dr. Atia is a, a close friend of mine. Uh, I've been on his podcast too, and, and he's a mentor to me actually. And um, you were the first person I listened to about uh, learning about this disease where I said, wow, we better get our act together now. And wow, neurologists really need to, to learn about this stuff because it's going to affect all physicians. Um, you know, just, just so the audience knows, you are a um, vaccineologist. Is that a word? Did I make that up? Uh, vaccinologist. Good. Oh, vaccinologist. Okay, great. Vaccinal yeah, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a vaccinologist. And the thing that really um, caught my attention initially was, uh, you know, years ago, you know, after MERS and SARS, I, it may have been in 2016, I'm not sure exactly when it was, and you can tell me, um, your team created a SARS vaccine. And, and literally, it's been sitting in a freezer for years. And I hope I'm paraphrasing correctly. But, um, you know, you testified to Congress about this. Um, th you know, we need a vaccine um, yesterday. Um, and the fact that you applied for money, and it's been, you know, uh, deprioritized um, in the past. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that whole process um, and you know what you said to Congress about this. Well, so uh, after I did my MD PhD at Rockefeller and Cornell in the 80s, and I loved it there and have great affection for uh, both institutions, uh, I decided to, to devote my life to developing vaccines for parasitic diseases, the one the big drug companies won't, won't take on, and actually started my MD PhD project developing a vaccine for hookworm infection. And now uh, that was 1980, 1987. And now decades later, we have several vaccines now in clinical development for Great. diseases like schistosomiasis and Chagas disease, uh, 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 et cetera. And then about a decade ago, we took on a coronavirus project because not that we were a virologist, but we had figured out how to advance the development of vaccines for diseases where the, they're not traditional markets. And we got approached by a group at the New York Blood Center, which is right across the street from you. Mm -hmm. And they have an excellent virology group headed by Lan Ying Du. And, and uh, they approached us to say, look, we've got a pretty exciting vaccine candidate. We applied to the NIH for it uh, jointly with Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and uh, the Galveston National Lab. We got it and we made it, manufactured it uh, for the original SARS vaccine, uh, SARS-1, and, um, and it uh, was, gave great protection in lab animals, great safety profile, but then we could never advance the funding to move it into clinical development. And this was not unique. I mean, this is what, what we do for our vaccines. You know, I'm constantly looking for funding to create a business model that doesn't exist. I, I sometimes say my, um, my autobiography is gonna be called Schnoring for Science uh, <laughs> one day. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, and then when we saw the news coming off the preprint servers like BioArchive, MedArchive from the Chinese in January, I said, oh my God, I mean, this is a coronavirus similar to SARS. In fact, now it's called SARS-2, it um, has a high degree of amino acid homology, binds to the same receptor. I said, you know, this could be a vaccine, a shovel-ready vaccine. And now we've been sort of moving it along, getting it viled, and now hoping to get it into clinical trials soon. And then we're also building out the second uh, corresponding one specific for COVID-19. So we have the SARS-1 receptor binding domain vaccine going into clinical trials and then this new one hopefully and hopefully engaging soon the FDA uh, on these. The, the tragedy of course is had we been able to track 
funding way back when, we would have been further along. But, you know, this is the story of neglected and emerging infections. We don't have a good ecosystem for, for advancing these technologies. And yeah, so, you know, this, this is just, um, you know, this really exposes, uh, you know, these flaws, these major gaping holes in, in the funding of medical research. Um, you know, we're a reactive, you know, market-driven sort of um, non-proactive, um, you know, group of, of science, uh, you know, funding mechanisms out there. And, you know, it, 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 drives, drive, it drives me crazy. So I'm an, I'm an Alzheimer's specialist. Um, I, I focus on Alzheimer's prevention uh, and I, I treat Alzheimer's patients, but, you know, Alzheimer's starts in the brain decades earlier and, you know, they're working on vaccines for Alzheimer's, but um, they're kind of giving them too late. So, you know, I've, I've run up uh, into the same brick wall after brick wall. Um, you know, I, I read in one one uh, one piece that you were looking for something like three million dollars a few months ago to, to move the move the needle a little bit. Like three million dollars is like pennies compared to the two trillion dollar stimulus. I know, really. I mean, talk about a million to one rate of return. How else can I? How else can you get that right? So. Un Unbelievable. Um, yeah. Were you able to get some funding? Hopefully, I don't, we, I don't we do. We have enough funding to get a little bit to get started, but we still don't even have the full three million yet. So we're still, oh, you got to be still kidding by me. less than halfway there. So that's uh, how is this possible? Really amazing. Wow. But, um, um, but we are moving forward, and the other thing we're trying to do is really not only look at our vaccine for the U.S. Mm-hmm. We think there's an opportunity to make this a, a global health vaccine. Because it's it's a recombinant protein uses a very traditional technology in yeast, the same technology used to make the hepatitis B vaccine. So we're hoping that this will be one of the first global health vaccines. Because what are you going to? How are you going to do social distancing yeah. in crowded urban areas in Mumbai or Delhi or Dhaka or Lagos or Sao Paulo? You're not. And so I'm really worried about a slaughter as this virus goes through low and middle income countries and. Yeah. and that's that's a story we're ha- even in itself we're having trouble uh, getting out. Yeah. Um, um, wonder, in fact, you know, it's it's it just as a side note, you know, I'm often because of global health, I often have a parade of medical students and residents saying, "Hey, Doctor, I wanted to go into global health," and yeah. they're often surprised when I tell them to go into neurology. I say, <laughs> you know, some of the great global health problems are neurologic problems, right? right. I mean, and we don't really know the mechanism. Cerebral malaria, probably the, uh, maybe the leading killer of children is a pedi- problem in pediatric neurology, cerebral malaria. We still don't really understand the mechanisms. Or now we're starting to see epilepsy linked to river blindness, onchocerciasis. We have no idea what the mechanism is. There's so many uh, pressing uh, neurologic issues around global health, and then all the mental health issues from neglected tropical diseases, the social stigma. So there's a huge mental health aspect to to global health as well that really needs to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, in in terms of neurology, um, you know, a lot of us embrace preventative therapy. You know, from headache disorders to epilepsy prevention. You know, they want to prevent seizures, prevent a headache from happening. Um, but we just need to think about this more broadly, and you know, to to ex- and extend this to emerging pathogens. You know, you, you you had the notion that maybe we should do something about SARS and MERS. You know, now that we know about it, we should do something to prevent the future occurrence because it's it's not a matter of if it's it's a matter of when, um, and I guess maybe if I could just take a step back and just say, you know, how do you stay motivated to keep doing this stuff when you keep hitting these brick walls? You know, I'm a clinician researcher. Um, we have basic scientists, um, you know, in neurology clinicians, uh, clinician researchers that that keep hitting these brick walls. And you know, it seems to me that you know sometimes certain types of research gets all the funding, you know, or a lot of the funding. But innovative, forward thinking, you know, game changing, like literally world changing ideas. If you would have gotten that project funded four or five years ago, um, some of these ideas just get stuck in the muck. Do you have any words of wisdom or, you know, advice for our, our members who are kind of in the trenches trying to study some of these diseases, um, whether it's a, a, a very common, you know, cerebral malaria, for example, even though most people don't even think that it, you know, may not even realize how common it is, whether it's a rare disease, a, a, a common disease, do you have any just gestalt advice for our members? I think a few things. I think the, you know one one of them is uh, try. I try to work on several projects at once because you're right. You do hit walls, and sometimes and what I've noticed over the years is we have about five or six vaccines now, and 
and we can't get it. So we stopped making progress on SARS and MERS, but then we got some funding for our Chagas disease vaccine and certain things, the buttons of, of, of certain donors. Right. And so, you know, try to diversify, and it's always a balance, right? Because mm. we know that, especially if you're applying for NIH grant study section, wants you to be focused and show a track record in one area. Yeah. But on the other hand, sometimes you have to go into multiple areas in order to, to achieve success. I would say the one thing that I've noticed is we have such a drop off in the number of physicians who are pursuing scientific pursuits, who are still, you know, look, asking hypothesis driven questions and writing papers just by being one of those, you will make progress because the, the, as, I mean, just think of the, the, your classmates in medical school, uh, how many of them are either running labs or doing, you know, asking complicated academic projects, Pro probably not too many. And, uh, and that's, there's been a real drop off in physician scientists, except for the handful of MD PhDs that we're still training. So I would say just by the fact that you're still in the game, still in the mix, you're, you're a survivor, therefore you're going to be successful. And, and, and I tell myself that a lot as well. Yeah, well, that's, that's really helpful. And I just want to repeat that because that's important. Um, just the fact that we're still in the game means we're successful. Um, and right. I think that's important. And, you know, I'm a, I mentor several, um, several neurology residents. I was a neurology residency program director for 12 years. I made it through bloody and bruised, but great, great. Really enjoyed it. Trained over 100 residents. And it, it just surprised me that, you know, so many MD, PhDs, literally from the best MSTP programs in the country, from Wash U to Cornell to all over the country, I feel like at least 50% of MD PhDs that came out of our programs, amazing, like strong people, brilliant minds, ended up not really pursuing a career in research. And yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, uh, we, yeah we gotta, you know, it, it's some. I know this is a bit off topic, but I mean, one one of the books that I'd like to I like to write books, and uh, one of them that I've been tinkering around with, I probably won't ever actually get to write it is. Mm -hmm who killed the physician scientist in America. Uh -huh. And uh, there's lots of fingers to point at. And because um, yeah. uh, we, we just don't do enough. And, and it's sort of self-fulfilling because as you get fewer and fewer physician scientists, there are fewer and fewer role models. So young, so medical students don't even think about becoming a physician scientist every day anymore. And, and the, and the heavy hand of the accrediting, bodies, you know, and, and this focus on uh, everything so over-credentialed and so focused on board exams and studying for tests. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, I remember when I took my uh, USM, uh, USMLE, the step one, mm. I had to pass it. I remember I had to pass it, but no one ever cared about my score. It was never used for a residency. So what did I do? I remember I never really learned kidney physiology very well, and I thought... Mm. Maybe I should learn, you know, open up the West book on kidney physiology and look at it again. And I still did the worst on kidney physiology. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was it. And, and now, you know, rather than having medical students in, in my lab or, you know, writing an interesting policy project, oh, Dr. Hotez, I got to study for step one. I mean, they disappear for months studying for that stupid exam that, uh, I don't know, stupid exam, maybe that's a little strong, but... Yeah. You know, it's it's too much focusing on on what you're certified in this and that and the compliance the credentialing. It just sucks the life out of you. And we've got to figure out a way to give some of that time back to do interesting. Yeah, things. yeah. I mean, I, I you just took the word. I mean, I could not agree with you more. Um, I do have a, a little bit of good news. You may not have heard. Um, USMLE Step One is going to pass fail as of I believe mm -hmm. next year or the year after. So someone is listening to you. So <laughs> the change right. the change will be made. Uh, sooner than later, which is good. Um, I got three questions for you, um, and I want to make good use of your time. You've been so um, just generous with, with coming on and sharing your, your, your expertise with, with our members. Um, three quick things. Number one, um, the Spanish flu, um, and I heard you say this in an interview, was the Spanish flu of uh, 2018 or something, or 19, uh, 19, 1918. But it didn't really just last for that one year. It was the 1919 and 1920. I mean, this was, th these pandemics... Um, you know, I guess I think a lot of people just aren't realizing that maybe this um, new 
virus is going to be wreaking havoc on our society, not just for a few weeks and months until social distancing ends. And, you know, we're just all wanting to get back to baseball games and things like that. But, you know, um, this may be a multi-year thing. What, what, what is your gestalt about that? Well, I would say, you know, with the, and one of the thing about new virus pathogens is they set you up to make you look stupid. So anything you say and predict usually will turn out to be wrong. And so, for instance, I, I use the example of Zika, and I know in the, the neurology community got really involved and was extraordinary, did some extraordinary studies on the whole mm -hmm. pathogenesis of Zika virus infection and the way that came on the scene across uh, the Americas in 2016. And by 2017, it was mostly gone. And by 2018, it looked like it was completely gone. What happened there? I mean, that, right. it, you know, to me, you know, I understand how it emerged and how it spread through the population. I still don't really understand how it disappeared so quickly. And then does that come back? With respiratory virus pathogens, they usually have a little longer half-life. And, and to make people understand that, I do point to the 1918 flu pandemic. And that started in early 1918, but when Woodrow Wilson got sick at the Treaty of Versailles, uh, for, and he was out for two weeks during those negotiations, he was out for, it was in the middle of 1919, and the thing didn't finally end until 1920. And so one of the things that I've started to introduce the idea of is to say, you know, there's kind of this magical thinking out there that, uh, that, that okay, we just hunker down for a few months, and then we'll have the vaccine and everyone will get vaccinated and then we can, you know, go have a big picnic in Central Park. And, and, and it, that's not going to work that way for a number of reasons. One, I think it could be like the flu pandemic where this could be on for three years and you say, oh, my God, what are you telling us that we're going to, you know, not go outside for three years? No, I think it'll disappear and uh, in part because of the aggressive social distancing that we've been doing, but then it could come back in, in several waves. And uh, maybe a wave will happen towards the end of this year, maybe early next year, this time around next year. And that's gonna be the tough part is managing that ebb and flow of, of the epidemic and how are we gonna get people to cooperate with that? Or the opposite, people have so much PTSD about even being outside and being with friends or going to a bar or a restaurant, you know, how are we going to deal with that? So this is going to be very complicated. And what I've recommended is to put out a high level commission where we can actually explore this a bit more and make some recommendations, look at the models, when am I might come back, how we're going to deal with it at, at multiple levels at the level of biomedical science, but also at the level of uh, uh, policy and, and the level of working with business leaders and government leaders. This is going to be very complicated. And, and then I talked to them about the inconvenient truth about vaccines, you know, that I point out the average length of time it takes to make a vaccine is 10 to 20 years. And I, you know, I've been doing vaccines since I was an MD PhD student a hundred years ago. Yeah. Now we've got several vaccines in clinical trials, but that's a long time horizon. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the record is, is Ebola. I think that's five years. And uh, Paul Offit is a friend and colleague at Penn, tells me that they did mumps in four years. Okay, so maybe four years, but uh, still to- You would say in 18 months, so it's gonna be here, right? Months. So, you know, you don't, you have to be careful too. You don't wanna be throwing cold water on people's aspirations. So what I've been saying is, look, I'm up at four in the morning every day and contacting colleagues, we're doing conference calls with Asia and Europe, trying to figure this out, trying to raise money. And it's all hands on deck to see if we can make it happen, but recognize that if you put your whole national plan around having a vaccine in a year to 18 months, you're likely to be severely disappointed. So we've got to have plan A and plan B at least. Yeah, that was, that was super helpful. Um, another question. Um, what's your gestalt about the medium and long-term impacts of, uh, and the sequelae of COVID-19? Because, you, know, um, you know, I have a neurologist colleague. He's, he, he's uh, 29 days out from COVID-19. He still can't breathe right. His lung's not right. You know, we're, we're talking in the medium. We're talking kind of, you know, let's get someone off of a ventilator. Let's hopefully they don't need a ventilator. Let's get more ventilators. Let's get them out of the hospital. We're, we're so focused on the short term because it's the, the ca catastrophe we're dealing with. What do you think is going to be the long-term sequela if you had to guess based on your experience in the past? 
Well, you know, we've seen this with other severe viral pneumonias. Adenovirus can, can do this uh, as well. It can cause a pretty severe respiratory disease. So you've got at least two components. You've got the, uh, the initial virus insult uh, in the lungs and, and direct damage, direct cytopathology from the virus, but then you have a huge host inflammatory component with all that cytokine storm, call it interleukin-6 and and producing a syndrome that had bears some resemblance, not entirely, but closely to ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and a lot of lung edema. And so you one has to assume that there's going to be fibrosis, there's going to be um, maybe not permanent, but there, it could take a long time before the lungs start to remodel. And there's actually one group now looking at some mesenchymal stem cells uh, as, as a form of repair for this. But that's, that's, the, that's maybe just the beginning because one of the things that I've been looking at, if you look at some of those preprints and med archives coming out of China now, now Europe is a lot of severe heart disease mm -hmm. and, heart, and heart failure. Myocarditis too, I believe. I don't think we understand what that's about. So mm -hmm. maybe it's you know, myocardial injury from uh, lack of oxygen on the, uh, being on the ventilator, although some of my ICU colleagues say, you know, that doesn't really happen. Yeah. Um, is there direct virus, viral, in, direct cardiac injury from the virus? There are the same receptor that's in the lungs as in endothelial cells, maybe mm -hmm. our tissue, the, uh, the, uh, um, the angiotensin converting enzyme two, right. the carboxypeptidase is the receptor that may be involved in the heart. And then as you point out, you know, some of the neurologic sequelae, which is quite interesting, right? The uh, yeah. loss, the anosmia, the loss of smell and yeah. loss of taste, some, some people are saying, maybe right. due to epithelia that has the receptor. And, and uh, uh, so that's going to be interesting. And then, you know, with long-term virus infections, and so you often see the depression afterwards. Mm -hmm. and then I don't think we, uh, like for instance, in Texas, where we see a lot of West Nile virus, mm -hmm. long-term depression uh, afterwards. So we don't think we really understand the basis of that. Maybe in some cases, it's, uh -huh. it's, the, it's the consequence of an encephalitis, but I don't think it, you, you're always seeing that. So I think that would be something to look for as well. We hear about this uh, after influenza. So even though, quote, it's a respiratory virus pathogen, there clearly are a number of systemic effects and it's all going to be really important to look at. Yeah, really helpful. Um, I just, you know, I just read a study out of South Korea where they tested and the people became negative and then they became positive again. Do, do you think this is just uh, an issue with testing or do you think this is like something like herpes or something like HIV where it could, you know, go dormant and come back? Because, you know, that would freak me out as, as a physician. I, I don't think that's, you know, you never say never, but with most respiratory virus pathogens, you develop an antibody response and then you're resistant at least for a while and right. with SARS-1 people had high levels of antibody for two to three years afterwards and you can even detect it four or five years out and in the case of SARS-2 this new one they've infected rhesus macaques and gotten an antibody response and they've failed to be able to reinfect them so okay. that suggests that that it is protective. I think what there's a couple of things going on Respiratory virus pathogen diagnosis has problems, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and, and the Gates Foundation has a big program in respiratory pathogens, and you get both false negatives and false positives. You also, we've seen this from the literature, uh, because there's a number of upper respiratory viruses that cause, uh, not COVID, but uh, other non-SARS, non non-MERS, non-SARS-2, upper respiratory tract coronaviruses where they've seen kids who are positive with no symptoms and kids who are negative with symptoms. And that may be a sampling problem. So there's a lot of false positives and false negatives mm -hmm. to begin with. I also think what happens sometimes is, uh, and people have this experience with influenza, you're starting to feel better and then you get feel sick again. Right. So I think it's a waxing and waning course. And then you have this problem with flu of heart disease and, and myocardial infarction, acute heart injury right. after flu. And that's a major cause of death from flu. That's why I, I yell at people to get vaccinated right. for that. And I think we're probably going to see that with this one as well. 
Gotcha. And, and last, last thing that you just mentioned about the antibodies. Um, and I've seen different um, theories, different reports, different, you know, hypothesis about, you said maybe, maybe these last for two to three years, maybe longer. Um, I saw another report, maybe, maybe a few months. And I, I don't know where that came from. If you had to kind of guess, I know this is impossible, but um, based on, you know, SARS-1, maybe, do you think antibodies should, could last for two to three years, or is it just too hard to say? I think they will. I think they will. It's, um, uh, we see, you know, I, I'm taking a lot of lessons learned from the first stars because I think there are a lot of similarities. So antibodies were persistent for, uh, for a few years. They seem to be, I think they're really going to be linked to protection, whether they'll last forever. You know, even with measles antibody testing, sometimes you see the titer go down, but there's still memory B cells there. So there's going to be a lot to work out with long-term protection. I think the bigger question is when they start doing seroprevalence testing across the U.S., meaning the percentage of Americans that were actually exposed to the virus might not have realized it, what's that number going to look like? Right. So I have my Hotez hunch factor, which is pretty non-scientific. <laughs> and you'll be happy to know this is the first time I've ever said it. So, And, I, <laughs> and uh, although I vetted it with my wife, Anna, uh, uh. <laughs> Walked this morning, looking like we're about to rob, rob a stagecoach with right. my hat and my um, <laughs> um, bandana. Well, when, the, when the term catches on, you said it here but, first, so we're going to get like a thousand more views or twenty thousand more views or whatever it is. So, so I've said, you know, if you look at ICU, I, I've because the diagnostic testing has been so unreliable. Who knows what that mm -hmm. half million case confirmed cases in the U.S. means right now? That as so as we're talking, you're saying roughly half a million confirmed cases, 20,000 deaths. I think that a better number, the one you can really hang on to a little better is the number of ICU patients, right? Because you can't make that up and you can't sort of hide. That's for something very visceral and tangible. Yeah. I'm seeing, I think you may turn out, the, the better estimate might be to take the number of ICU patients and multiply by a factor, which could be as high as 100 to get a better number of cases. Yeah or the number of fatalities and multiply by a thousand. And if you do that, then you get, if there's 20,000 deaths, you get about 20 million cases in, in the United States. And that may be an accurate number. We'll see how it pans out. Right. But, but what that means is the vast majority of Americans still have not gotten infected with this virus, if, if that's the case. That's scary. So you talk, you talk about seroprevalence, you know, using that, it's syrup, being seropositive to go back to work. Well, mm -hmm. you know, at least nine out of 10 Americans are not going to be seropositive yet. So how do you manage that? Do you wait now for the second wave and the third wave? And mm -hmm. So all of this, lots of complexities, lots of modeling that needs to be done. And it's going to uh, take a, a lot of time. And then the question is, who's going to organize this roadmap? And mm -hmm. I the recommendation. I like making recommendations that nobody likes. And so, <laughs> so one of them is I said this would be a good role for the National Academies, National yeah. Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine. Say, look, right. this would be a good role charting that roadmap for how you, mm -hmm. in anticipation that the virus comes back on an annual basis, how how you manage that. And uh, and I th I think everyone's so focused right now on getting the economy back. Uh, in the next uh, in the next few weeks, that we're not really thinking about the long term. Yeah, but I think that's going to be very important. I I was on MSNBC yesterday, and right before I came on, the guy who was finishing his show is this guy Chuck Todd. Mm -hmm. Said I said something very wise. He said, you know, the the presidential election is going to be decided on whoever can convince the country that he can lead the COVID nineteen recovery. And I, I think it actually is very wise. I think that that may be true. And then, and then I would add dot, dot, dot. Well, don't, and that it's not just about what we do in the coming weeks. It's going to be factoring in this possibility that's going to come back on a, on a yearly basis. And, and how do you manage that? And this is going to be very complicated and unprecedented for, for the country, but that that's, that's where I think we need to focus then. Yeah. Well, I, I hope our country, our world, um, our various accrediting bodies, organizations learn a lot from this. Um, and, you know, just, just, just on behalf of all of our members of the AN and on behalf of just to be very 
um, honest society and the population around the world. Thank you for all, all that you're doing. Thanks for um, hitting the brick wall and getting right back up and pushing forward um, and uh, leading these multinational, international teams, getting up at 4 a.m. You got to get your sleep, man. Get sleep. 4.30? Yeah, the, that, sleep, that, that sleep thing is real. I get, it's yeah, bad for the brain. Emotional. I get real emotional and grumpy. But I'm, yeah. I'm, sh- I'm sure. Dr. Hotez, thank you so much on behalf of uh, the AAN and behalf of everybody. Thanks again. Thanks again for all your work.